Goat format has been around for over 17 years now, but the community is continuing to grow. It can be somewhat overwhelming for new players to approach this format due to the sheer amount of time that veteran players have already put into developing their decks, playstyles, and habits. If you are a newer player in GOAT format and you're struggling to find your footing, then this is the video for you. Welcome back to GOAT Duels, I'm Infusions Cap, and today I want to bring you 5 tips for new and intermediate level players in GOAT format. Tip number 1, Correct Sequencing. You should always be looking to play your cards in an order that gives your opponent the least amount of information while providing you with the most information. Too often I see players, usually newer players, but even seasoned veterans who are under pressure, make this mistake. The most common example of this that comes to mind is in the opening hand. Let's say you are on the play and you manage to get Pot of Greed and Delinquent Duo in your opening hand. I oftentimes see players get excited and just slam Pot of Greed first. This is a mistake, however, because you want to lead with Delinquent Duo. The reason for this is because knowing which two cards you will get off of Pot of Greed won't change what you pick for discarding with Delinquent Duo because your discard is random. But if your opponent knows that you also got a plus one off of your Pot of Greed as well as a plus one off of your Duo, then it does give them additional information for the card they are planning to discard. Usually this is a minor thing, but it's a good mindset to get into. And at the highest levels of play, small things like this can be the slight edge you need to win a tough game. This example is even more magnified if you bring Graceful Charity into the mix. Again, I see newer players get excited to draw cards, so they slam Pot, slam Graceful, and then Duo. Obviously, if you don't have the Duo before you draw new cards, then that's the only way to do it. But if you open with the draw cards and the Duo, you want to Duo first, not only to deprive the opponent of information, but to also increase the information you have for your discards off of Graceful Charity, because not only will you have the maximum number of cards in hand at the time of discarding for Graceful, with a Duo Pot Graceful sequence, you will also get to see two cards from your opponent's hand discarded to Duo, which gives you information on potential power cards like Heavy Storm or Mirror Force maybe being out of the mix early on, or at the very least can give you information about the matchup. For example, if your opponent loses a copy of Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke to Delinquent Duo, then it's a pretty safe bet that they're on an aggressive warrior strategy, and you may have something like Nobleman of Crossout, which is traditionally bad in that matchup, that you could just discard to your Graceful Charity simply because you were able to mine a little bit of free information by sequencing your cards correctly. These are straightforward examples, but the important thing is to build that mindset. This line of thinking brings us to tip number two as well. Tip number two, use main phase two correctly. If you're going to make a play that does not pertain to the current turn's battle phase, try to do it in main phase two. Obviously there are a couple of exceptions to this, which we will talk about in a moment, but most of those are based on specific matchups or situational reads on specific cards. For the most part, however, you want to do things like setting monsters and setting traps in main phase two. The reason for this is, like with the first tip, it's all about depriving the opponent of information while giving yourself more information. One really common scenario in the same line of thinking that we see often is when an opponent has a face-down backfield card and a face-down monster, commonly known as the T-set, and on your turn, you summon a monster and then use Nobleman of Cross out after the summon is successful. The obvious reasoning for this play is to play around Torrential Tribute, but something else it does is deprive your opponent of information while giving information to you. Since the opponent does not know you have Nobleman, they may use their set spell or trap, and then you get to keep your Nobleman, and they still don't know you have it, but you gained information on their backfield while simplifying the game state. The same line of thinking can be applied to sequencing your plays around the battle phase. If you set a monster in main phase 1, you are most often working against the goal of giving yourself information and depriving your opponent of information, because this provides your opponent with the insight that you don't have a normal summon coming in main phase 2, which can change their decision about using a battle trap, for example. This also means that if the battle phase does not go as you planned, then you no longer have the summon option in main phase 2 to adjust your plans to adapt to what happened in the battle phase, because you're locked into the choice you already made. So by going the route of setting in main phase 1 instead of testing the waters and then doing your sets in main phase 2, 
you're actually limiting the information you have and giving information to your opponent instead. Like any good rule, however, there are occasional exceptions to it, and these exceptions are usually centered around cards like Morphing Jar or Deskawala. If you have a read or a gut feeling that your opponent may have one of these cards as a set monster that you are planning to attack into, then you may want to break this rule and do some sets in main phase 1 even if they don't directly pertain to the battle phase of the current turn. While burn decks are where you will most commonly run into these kinds of scenarios, they are possible choices for more controlling decks as well. This is just something else to keep in mind as a possible variation from the standard that you might need to make. A lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! is judgment calls and information gathering, and this is a perfect example of where you may need to venture from the norm, but it's also important to understand the norm before you stray from the beaten path. Tip number three, reckless side decking. Side decking is, generally speaking, one of, if not the most difficult aspects of the game. It's also one of the strongest tools at your disposal to stay on top of rogue strategies or to tip a matchup where you are disadvantaged on paper back into your favor. There are tons of videos and articles out there where people talk about their side deck strategies from both a general perspective and for specific decks and specific matchups, and those approaches tend to evolve with the metagame. I recommend checking out more content on side decking because it's such a deep topic that it deserves to be explored by everyone, especially newer players. That being said, a lot of those videos and articles tend to focus on the these are bad in this matchup, so take them out, and these are good in this matchup, so put them in type of perspective. And while that is the core principle you're trying to achieve, the place where I see newer players falter a lot with their side decking is that they tunnel vision on the ceiling of those cards by analyzing them in a vacuum, and they lose sight of the bigger picture and don't protect their ratios when side decking. The deck where I see this happen most often against is Burn. The problem isn't exclusive to that deck, but it is common, so let's use that as an example. Let's say you lose game one, which isn't hard to do against a burn strategy. I do it all the time. When you go to side decking, the gut instinct is going to be to take out every dead card and just slam live cards into the deck. While a live card is always better than a dead card, it's important to think about what you were cutting and try to replace those cards with similar cards to protect your ratios. For example, if you end up dropping six traps from your deck and replacing them with six monsters, you probably aren't really giving yourself that many more live draws, because now your deck that main decks 18 monsters is going into game two with 24 monsters. And since you only get one normal summon in a turn, you're still likely to have a lot of dead cards on any given turn. This doesn't really give you more options in a literal sense, and in fact, it makes you more vulnerable to something like Dusk Koala, because you have a handful of cards that you simply can't deploy for any value. This is not to say that every monster card you side out needs to be replaced with a monster card, and every trap card needs to be replaced with a trap card 100% of the time, but the point is that the one normal summon per turn rule should be a factor when you make your side decking decisions. It's not enough to simply take out dead cards for live cards if the so-called live cards aren't really going to be live that often. Tip number four, narrow focus on side decking. Staying on the side decking topic a bit longer, since the theory behind it is so deep and it's such an important aspect of the game, another pitfall I see newer players making with side decking is failing to consider that the opponent gets to side deck as well. This may seem obvious, but it can be easy to get tunnel vision thinking only about the game that just took place while failing to consider the game that is coming up. As you are making changes to your deck, they are changing theirs as well. A lot of higher-level players who are familiar with the standard approaches to side-decking for each matchup will use this to their advantage and start to throw you curveballs in how they side. An easy example of this is something we are starting to see as a trend in warrior strategies. Nobleman of Crossout tends to be a dead card against warrior decks, so it's very standard at this point to side them out after the first game. Usually they are removed in favor of battle traps such as Sakuretsu Armor or something of that nature. Many clever warrior players have started siding in Gravekeeper Spy and Mobius the Frost Monarch as a unique way to punish the standard approach. Gravekeeper Spy can be difficult to deal with without Nobleman of Crossout, and it also floats monsters on the board to be tributed to summon Mobius the Frost Monarch, which can deal with the battle traps that are likely being sided in against the warriors. 
I'm not advocating for leaving noblemen in against warriors, because your focus against aggressive decks should be more on cards that are live more often, since the aggro decks want to bring the match down to a race as quickly as possible. But I do want to bring these kinds of scenarios to your attention, because little forks like that can be a way to gain an edge over an unsuspecting opponent. So as you learn and experiment, keep things like this in mind. If your opponent thinks they have a strength, see if you can find a way to turn it into a weakness. And finally, tip number five, play in a comfortable style. This is a big one. The number one thing I see newer players do is net deck and then resist making any changes. While net decking is a viable way to get started, I often encounter players who copy a deck that did really well at a tournament, and then if they don't immediately have success with it, they get discouraged, but also seem unwilling to tweak the existing list to suit their playstyle. Let's say you watch a video where someone is doing a deck profile on a deck that they've played hundreds of games with, and you think the deck is really good, and based on what they're telling you in the video, they had a strong tournament finish with it, or a win rate on the ladder that's well over 50%, or something of that nature. So you build it, you try it out, and you get absolutely demolished in the first four or five matches you play with the deck. This is the point where a lot of newer players may write the deck off and say it just isn't for them. Sometimes that may be true, not every strategy will appeal to everyone. Not everyone will like the slow control decks, not everyone will like aggressive approaches like Warriors, not everybody's going to like combo decks or something like Reasoning Gate, and that's okay. Before you abandon the strategy altogether, however, I would encourage you to make small adjustments to the deck and play with it more. It's difficult to pick up someone else's deck and play it as well as they do, especially for a newer player. It may not be the entire strategy that isn't working for you, it may just be certain facets of the deck. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to have a different opinion about a card or a deck or even about the metagame as a whole. Above all, the most important thing is to have fun with it. Rules are made to be broken when it comes to deck building. So play the cards that fit comfortably with the way you like to play the game, and don't fall into the trap of thinking that there's only one way to do something or that if something was good you would have seen more people using it by now. Even in a format that is almost two decades old, we still see innovation all the time, and there's always room for more of it. That's it for today. Thank you for watching, and if this video was helpful, be sure to like and subscribe for more GOAT format content. And until next time, duel well and duel often.